All right, fellas, what's up? Today, we're gonna talk bench press training, specifically what I think are the best and worst bench press accessories that you can put in your training program. Now, if you're new to the channel and you're asking, who's Bald Omni Man? Why should I listen to you? I'm gonna click off the video. I have an immensely strong upper body. I'm jacked. I have long arms. I'm not built for the bench press, and I still have a large bench press. On top of that, I'm a strength and conditioning coach, and I train people just as, if not stronger than myself. They also have different builds for me. So from top to bottom, long arms, short arms, short tall, I know how to build lifts, specifically here, the bench press. Now, in terms of how we're gonna rank these, it's more so gonna rank in terms of one carryover, order of importance in your program, and then utility, meaning what does it do? Those are the three main grading criteria. So before we get into my opinion, y'all tell me based off of those things, what you think are the S tier exercises and what you think are the D tier exercises. Now some GTA enjoyers might be eyeballing the cluck and bell icon. This is the preeminent first and foremost quote unquote accessory that you should be including in any program that you follow calories food macros fuel if you're not fueling your body you're not going to get big i'm sorry i'm not going to lie to you if you're small like 140 130 120 pounds and you want to get a big bench press you're going to need to nourish your body i'm not one of these people that's going to lie to you and say that you can maintain that body size and that body weight and become much more jacked and stronger tons of people have come to me since bulking and said i'm finally making results for the first time in my life changing nothing else in their training calories are king what else is king is rep quality now this isn't as important as calories. There are tons of people who just giga bulk and do whatever and get strong, right? Rep quality is almost important though. And the reason I say that is, is that if you don't practice good basics and foundational strategies like a good eccentric, a nice quality pause, you're gonna reach a plateau in your strength and hypertrophy a lot quicker because you're not doing these things that account for easy gains. So. Use a nice eccentric, use a nice pause, pause starting from zero. So it, it just happens to be that when you pause bench press, the time that you count in your head is almost always so much faster than the time that's transpiring in reality. So you think, yeah, this is a three count bench press. And then it ends up being barely a one count pause. So start counting from zero go zero Mississippi, one Mississippi, and then that's a one count pause typically. Now I would be remiss not to mention the OG Freaky D0550, AKA the OG deadlift or squat bench presser, and his favorite as well as my favorite bench press exercise, the Larson press. I got it from him a long time ago, I've used it ever since. The reason why it's so good is twofold and probably threefold. There's what doesn't the Larson Press do? It's like a Swiss Army knife. It does everything. The Larson Press does two main things that I can think of. One, it allows you to train your upper body musculature in absence of leg drive. And two, this is more, you know, for total body training, it removes uh, lower back fatigue. You statically contract your hips, your glutes, your hamstrings, your quads, and your lower back when you're incorporating leg drive into the bench press. Now, contrary to not popular belief, but boneheaded belief, leg drive is a thing. It is a thing that manifests in bench press. So when you do it, your bench press is stronger. When you do it, when you don't do it, your bench press isn't as strong. Whether you want to believe that's bracing force, your legs literally helping you push the bar directionally, or a combination of both. When you do it, you're strong. When you don't do it, you're not as strong. The reason why removing that is so great developmentally is that one, it allows you to train your upper body musculature without your leg drive assisting out of the bottom. This is gonna give you better off the chest strength and also a better contraction at the bottom. So it's making you more jacked and stronger both at the same time. This is why for me, it's an exercise that you always see me doing. I'm never not gonna Larson press. 
why it may not be a good option for some people is that it also reduces the amount of load that you can push. Now we just talked about why that's potentially a good thing. It's not good if you're a beginner. You know, if you're just getting into the gym, you're looking for lifting the most amount of weight that you can with reasonable form to give your body a good neurological adaptation, meaning your body is going to get stronger because of you just lifting heavy loads without you gaining any additional muscle. If you're removing, say, what ends up being five or 10% from the bar for Larson press, that's five or 10% neurological gains that you're not getting. So I say this with love, guys. All you guys that uh, follow me that bench like 225, I, I love that you trust me and I love that you think the Larson press is cool, but you are literally leaving gains on the table. I'm just being honest with you. I know full well y'all are all gonna still do it. It's like a meme in the, the bald Omni-Man community that just everybody Larson presses, but I would not be doing you a, uh, a, a service if I didn't tell you the truth about that. Um, the five or 10% difference isn't anything substantial that usually just ends up being like between 20 and 30 pounds difference. That one more benefit is, is that it has a good stimulus to fatigue ratio. Because you're using less load, your body's not gonna get beat up as much with the Larson press as with the bench press. Now that was the most in-depth uh, description that we're gonna give for an exercise here because it's my favorite. It's time stamped. you can skip to your favorite exercise if you want to see where it goes. Next, we're gonna do a little bit of rapid fire. Upright rows, C tier hammer curls, S tier, and assault bike, C tier. Now, it's it's also another joke within the Bald Omni Man community that no matter what tier list I make, the assault bike always goes on top. It's just always a top tier exercise. It just happens to be, since we're talking upper body, it's, it's just basically a warm up to its cardio. Upright rows are another popular exercise in my community. Uh, contrary to popular belief, they are not intrinsically bad for your shoulders. No movement is inherently bad for any part of your body, provided that you load it sensibly and use form that is proper for you. This applies to squats. Any exercise that people say is dangerous, certainly the upright road also applies. The reason why it's in C tier, what I typically would rank it a little bit higher, it does a lot of things. It works your upper back, your shoulders, your rotator cuffs, your rear delts, but it doesn't do any of those one things very well at least not compared to something like a seal row, which works the upper upper back and you know lats and everything very well, which is an S tier exercise. Now hammer curls might be a little bit of a curveball, and then we'll talk about seal rows a little bit. Hammer curls are a little bit of a curveball for some people. They're thinking, dude, biceps having carryover for bench press, I'm clicking off the video. Well, guys, listen, I also think it's a meme that bench press is meaningfully assisted by bigger biceps. That is a complete joke in my opinion. The reason why, and this comes into the utility piece that we talked about, this is an S tier, is because it warms up your elbows really well. If you're doing a lot of pressing, a lot of tricep work, a lot of just moving your arms back and forth under load, your elbows are the one of the joints that mainly facilitates that. Your, 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 your elbows are taking a big beating with you know optimal bench press training. I just said optimal, my goodness. With good bench press training, there's no such thing as optimal. Um, hammer curls are a low cost option to getting those elbows nice and warm. They're like rear delt flies. They're an S tier, not because they're gonna make a night and day difference, but because they're always gonna be included in your program. They're a staple. Now, chest supported rows and seal rows. For example, here we got the chest supported T-bar row and then the OG seal row, which I am also known for doing in addition to the Larson press. Comment down below if you've uh, watched some of my Instagram stories where I uh, showed a guy doing seal rows and some Jodeci music. Every time I close my eyes. Y'all know the vibe. Now, I really like seal rows for bench press training, specifically overstanding barbell rows, which are also gonna go in S tier, spoiler alert. It's a slight difference between the two, which is why I have to put the, the chest supported row over the standing row in this particular instance. It allows you to push your upper back to and beyond failure. 
It also allows you to get a strict stimulus on your upper back. Now, far be it from me to say that you can't do that with a standing barbell row. You can absolutely just only use your back and your arms to move the weight. But there is a lower back fatigue that comes with that as well. You don't get that on the seal row or on a chest supported row. Now, it also allows you to push that musculature beyond failure because you can easily do stuff if you're, you know, a Johnny bodybuilder, Jimmy Musclehead, you can do like force reps where you're doing like three quarters of the way up. You're, you know, you did your last full range of motion rep. Now you're doing your three quarter reps and then you're doing your half reps and then you can't move it at all. And like as a finisher or something, you can do that on seal rows and on chest supported rows. You can do that on standing barbell rows, but it just, it doesn't have the same feel. Now let's go ahead and rank one that is D tier. There's not a lot of D tier exercises that you can incorporate in a bench press program, but like we alluded to a little bit earlier, bicep training for the most part in terms of getting a big bench press is a meme. It's a complete joke and a waste of time if you're not doing something like hammer curls in my opinion. The reason for this being is that this is like an old school adage. I, there's a lot of knowledge in old school. I think old school is right 99% of the time. This is the 1% of things that just don't make sense. The, the ideology is that if you have big biceps, you know, it helps the, you know, bounce you out the bottom on the bench press. It's just not gonna do that. Like you can increase your bicep size tremendously. And if your chest and triceps and shoulders don't get bigger or don't get as big, your bench press is not going to reflect the size of your biceps. So don't curl in hopes of getting a big bench press. It's just not gonna happen. We all know those curl bros that can't hardly bench 225 or when they see someone bench three plates, they think they're on steroids because they, they don't, you know, they don't train bench press adequately. Now, one that is very, very slept on that I think is really, really good. This is another old school lift that actually predates the bench press, the floor press. This is really good. Now, it does something that I call training the mid-range. So it's not quite lockout, it's not quite off the chest. It's that no man's land weakness that some people, especially guys with longer arms like myself have, where it's not that they weren't quite so strong off the chest and it's not that they can't lock it out. It's just that they stop accelerating somewhere in between that, the true mid-range. This isn't a problem for most people, but this is just one of the benefits we're talking about. The floor press trains that mid-range very well. Now the main benefit is that just like with the Larson press, it removes leg drive, any lower body fatigue at all since you can't use any sort of arch, any sort of leg drive on floor press either. It also allows you to train your chest with a better peak contraction because you break up the concentric and eccentric chain. It also gives you a truer pause since you're literally just releasing your arms onto the floor and you're releasing all your built up energy and inertia into the floor. It's a much truer pause. Uh, floor, floor press classically feels a lot stickier when you pause than, than bench press for that very reason. Very, very good. I would put it after like a main bench press exercise. My boy BQ is a big fan of these as well. Shout out to BQ. Now another exercise that I would say is S tier is the close grip bench. And for you uh, Larson press enjoyers and your, your happy Larson press noises that you make when you, you Larson press when you're not supposed to, it's just like a kid you know, sticking their hand in the cookie jar when they know they're not supposed to. And I'm like that dad that wants to yell at you, but I'm not going to because I love that, you're, I love that you love the cookies. Um, close grip bench is going to be a lot more worthwhile for you fellas that are you know newer to lifting. All jokes aside, and you want to lift, it's going to give you a better bang for your buck and be more worth your time. The Larson Press does not really specifically address any deep foundational weakness. The close grip bench does. One, it's increasing the range of motion by a ton. Two, it's working your triceps and your shoulders a lot harder than like a wider grip bench press. Both of those things are very, very valuable for any lifter of any level, but especially when you're in your early developmental stages. So when you're in your larval stage, you're, um, what's the freaking Pokemon's name? I'm such a boomer. Uh, Caterpie. When you're in your Caterpie stage, I know that was heresy not to know the Gen 1 Pokemon name. Don't don't roast me too bad in the comments for that. I haven't played Pokemon in a long time. I only know really the chatty ones. 
like Machamp and Geodude and all those, those jacked ones. But if you're in your Caterpie stage, you want to be addressing things that increase you developmentally as opposed to just doing stuff that you think looks cool. Definitely do that, but don't eat your cake before you, you have your meat and potatoes. Now, I would be remiss not to mention um, the company that sponsors me, Bells of Steel, and their arch nemesis bar. Now, stop. Before you click off the video, this is not a shill. This is not a commercial for Bells of Steel. I'm one of those people where I'm only going to endorse your products if I fully believe in them. Um, and I really, truly believe that the company that I'm sponsored by, Bells of Steel, is a top-notch equipment manufacturer. Specifically, this Arch Nemesis bar. I've been using it a lot lately. I actually renamed it uh, kind of heretically to, <laughs> to the Hercules Press, the specific exercise that you can do with it, after my boy, Ken Cooper. Funny story. We'll tell a little story, and then we'll talk about why this movement is good. Uh, Ken is a, or was, a thrower for MIT. He's like a 300-something pound, six foot four superhuman. Um, just massive guy. He did a, a neutral bar, neutral grip, cambered, increased range of motion bench press with like 500 pounds. And I was like, dude, this is immense. I'm just going to name this exercise after you. I'm going to call it the Hercules Press. His name is Ginger Cleus on uh, Instagram. So that's where Hercules comes from. The reason why the neutral grip, deeper cambered bar range of motion bench press, we'll call it the Hercules Press, is so good is because it's a neutral grip. It's really easy on the shoulders, really tough on the triceps. So it gives you that good tricep stimulus. Also, because it has that bend in the middle, you're getting a deeper stretch and range of motion on your pecs as well. So overall, it's just an, an insane developmental tool. If you want to pick up one of these bars, as I said, do not feel pressured to do it. But if you're interested, I link my affiliate link under all my videos. Go ahead and click that. Grab you one of them, one or two of those. Now... The regular Cambert bar bench press is really good as well. I don't think it is as good as the the neutral bar just because, because it's a straight bar, it's still going to be a little tougher on your shoulders. So you can't push it quite as hard in my experience or in my opinion. Now, I bet a lot of calisthenics bros were looking to see where I would rank dips. This is going to just include weighted dips, ring dips, ring turned out dips. Uh, band assisted dips, assisted, like whatever, dips. Dips go in A tier, and I'm going to tell you why I don't put them in S tier. Dips are a worthy addition in any bench press training program. The reason why I don't put them in S tier is twofold. One, a dip is not specific to a bench press, meaning if you put 100 pounds on your dip, it is not going to put 100 pounds on your bench press. If you put 100 pounds on your close grip bench, that was the gods saying, no, nah, put it in put it in S tier. I don't know how A tier ended up above S tier. Let's go ahead and fix that. That was the gods trying to strike me down for the heresy that was coming out of my mouth. But as I was saying, uh, uh, Sky Daddy, it's not going to put the same amount of poundage on your bench press as, say, something... A close grip bench, putting 100 pounds on that is going to put 100 pounds on your regular bench press. Putting 100 pounds on your Larson press is going to put 100 pounds on your bench press, so on and so on. You'll get some carryover from it, but it's not going to be one-to-one. -one. So on a carryover basis, it, it loses points. Now, also on a fatigue to benefit basis, it also loses points. Now, I'm not one of those... Sammy sausage heads that says dips are just inherently bad for you. They're inherently bad for your shoulders. But in my experience, just working with myself, obviously, and working with others, they do carry a higher fatigue cost to your shoulders and rotator cuff than a bench press does. So you need to deload from them more often. You can keep them in your training program for very long, but not as long as something like a, a camber bar bench or a Larson press or anything like that. So their longevity in your training program is going to be limited before you have to switch it out for something else. Now it gets points in the following categories. It trains the heck out of your chest, triceps, and shoulders. It's different enough from your bench press to where if you're getting some overuse from doing too much bench pressing, you can throw in some dips for a little bit and alleviate some of that. So very, very good. 
very worthy exercise if you do them and you put it in your training program you're going to get jacked for it and you're still going to get strong i just don't put it in the s tier now let's talk about um the inimitable tricep rope push down we're going to put this in s tier twofold benefits one jack triceps big bench press Two, it's also a non-invasive tricep exercise, meaning if you're someone that classically has a lot of elbow fatigue, when you do something like a tricep French press, uh, tricep uh, overhead extension, anything like that, you're not going to get that nearly to the same magnitude with a single rope pushdown or a dual rope pushdown or anything like that. It's also going to allow you to later build the capacity to do those things. I made a really cool video. It's my Berserk Method self-coaching video. I recently, within the past couple months, did a 2022 edition of that video where I talk about kind of how you can train your elbows to become more tolerant of more invasive motions. It's fully timestamped. I break down so many concepts in that video. After you watch this video, please check that out. Now, I kind of ragged on these in the past. Um, I'm not going to do that in this video, and that was due to my own inherent biases with the movement and not necessarily the raw benefits that they bring. Just keeping myself accountable. Um, that being said, I still do rank them in context of a bench press training program in terms of overall utility, not as high as the rope pushdowns. The French press, this is going to be a, a, a catch-all for the overhead tricep extension, the tricep extension, the line, tri all the tr barbell tricep extensions. This is what we're ranking here, A tier. Very, very good, but not as good as the rope pushdown. Because, one, it has a higher you know, fatigue cost, it has a higher raw stimulus, but you're not going to be able to push it as hard at first or just even over the long term when compared to the tricep rope push down because of the elbow fatigue that it accumulates. Now you can alleviate that fatigue just by having tougher elbows and that's what I talk about in that self coaching video. But just on a basic exercise to exercise level, if I'm comparing what I just most often prescribe, it's almost always the rope push downs. Now, weighted push ups, calisthenic bros are, are eaten. In this video, I'm going to put the push-ups, and this is going to be heretical for some people because some people like dips better. I'm going to put the push-ups in S tier just simply because they have a greater carryover in my opinion. You know what? Just to be fair, I just thought of something. I'm going to put them in A tier above dips. I'm not going to put them in S tier. I'm going to put them in A tier because although they have higher carryover because they're a horizontal press, they are harder to load than dips. And if you're especially strong, there's only so many high rep sets that you can do with push-ups before, you know, it just doesn't become practical. So most people can practically add, maybe your gym has a hundred pound plate, right? I don't think most people are gonna bring a book bag or have a Kensui weighted vest that they can put weights into to load push-ups, it's just not practical to load very heavily. That being said, I do think it's a very good giga reps exercise, and giga reps is just a bald omni-man term for reps of 15 or more, so like 15, 20, 25. It's a good chest pressing variation for that reason, and if you get stronger on it, you are gonna get a stronger bench press, if provided that you're also bench pressing. It's like a one plus one equals three thing. Um, but because you can't really practically load it very heavily, that's sort of a con that keeps it out of that S tier because if you could do that, it would be an S tier exercise in my opinion, but it's tippity top of A tier in my opinion for that reason. Now we're gonna do a, a, a little rapid fire. So we're gonna do iliac pull downs, which are the optimal lat pulling exercise. They're not, we're gonna get to that in a second. Another back motion, dumbbell row. Um, and then uh, the rear delt fly. Now, uh, I used my bookworm voice to describe the iliac pull downs, not because I think they're a bad exercise, they're a good exercise when used in combination with a chest supported row or a seal row or a pull up, which we'll get to later. But it's not a movement that you can program based on, meaning you can build an entire back training program based off of increasing your chest supported row or your seal row. 
You cannot do that for an iliac pulldown simply because you can't load an iliac pulldown as heavily. So this is always going to be delegated to finisher or accessory. Period. Point blank. It is not going to be a foundational back builder in your program, period, no matter what it does. Now what it does is this. Yes, it works your the iliac division of your lower lats not better because even in this capacity your lower lats are still getting worked in a seal row and because the load is so much higher you're still getting a very strong stimulus in your lower lats but it isolates that and it also gives you a low stress motion that you can move your shoulder through potentially as a warm-up as well so it has utility it has limited utility and it's not as big of a you know a big back exercise as a seal row or a chest supported row so i just can't rank it any higher than that now we also have the rear delt fly in c tier i used to say that this was a deer d tier exercise but i uh was kindly reminded about this i think it was from uh, my boy sam sam sheather that john meadows used to go to war with rear delt flies doing them rest pause style and that they were an immense exercise when you did them like that I took that into account. I'm still a man that stands behind my opinions. I still think that like a like a cable rear delt fly being an S tier is a lot better just because your rear delt is under tension. With this, at the beginning of the range of motion from the, to the end, and with a rear delt fly, you're really only getting <coughs> rear delt stimulus at the end range of motion. It's just not as effective of an exercise if you're getting a quarter of the effective range of motion, if that. That's just my opinion. You can disagree with it if you want. I'm always gonna purport the cable rear delt fly or even, you know, I don't I don't know if I have the Powell raise on here, but if you're a dumbbells and barbells only kind of guy, the Powell raise is like exactly like the cable rear delt fly. Now, shoulder health exercises lou raise now i'm putting it above upright rows because it does two things very very well it works your scapula and your rear your uh your rotator cuff musculature very well it's a great warm-up exercise and it builds your upper back and shoulders very well and it's very low cost for what you get for it so you can just pretty much throw it anywhere in your training program and not have to really think about it it does pretty much everything an upright row does, except for, in my opinion, maybe work the upper back. It does it better. So it's just a better um, upright row for the most part. Now, another banger exercise that people might think is a little heretical. I'm gonna put the pec deck in A tier. Now the pec deck doesn't have as much utility for some people who get the most chest pressing volume that they need out of like a bench press but if you're someone that needs a little icing on the cake or just wants to do something like a pec fly just to alleviate some stress on the elbows deload the triceps a little bit it's a banging exercise for the pecs i can't hold you guys there's a reason why bodybuilders have been doing it for decades great resistance profile great stretch and squeeze on the pecs it's going to build them very well now if you only do pec flies you're going to have big pecs on a small bench press so don't do that just add it in addition to now i don't think the dumbbell pec fly is as good it doesn't have as good of a resistance profile it's arguably more dangerous if you're a Sammy sausage head and you use too much load on it. I don't think you can go to failure on it as safely with heavier loads. And it's just a worse version of the pec deck. There's a reason why the pec deck was created. It's just a better version of this. Now, another old school oldie but goodie. I'm going to put the dumbbell pullover in C tier. It's really good because it works your shoulders in terms of you know their ability to move through space that quality is something that you want to maintain the, the mobility in your upper back and your shoulders is going to keep you pain free and injury free and bench press it also works your lats um, just mostly for the shoulder benefits I'm gonna put it in C tier probably close to the bottom um, 
just because I feel like they're better obviously lap builders but it looks cool guys and it doesn't cost you anything to just throw it in your program like you're not gonna over fatigue yourself by throwing in freaking dumbbell pullovers now we're gonna go ahead and rank the strict standing barbell row S tier all the same benefits that apply to seal row apply here I just put it slightly lower because you know the rep quality, it's just intrinsic to the movement, is going to be harder to keep strict unless you just use, again, giga reps that, you know, you can really control with your lower back and not have to fling around. Um, and then as well, it does have an associated lower back fatigue. Now, calisthenics enjoyers are eating, like I said, pull-ups, pull, you know, chin-ups, wide grip pull-ups, whatever, S-tier. Works your upper back very well. Works the shoulder girdle very well. Keeps your overhead mo mobility very good. It's just a very good exercise. And honestly, I would put it on the same level as the chest supported row and the seal row. It's just as essential. It's just working that vertical pulling pattern as opposed to the horizontal pulling one. So very, very good. Include that. Now, I'm going to put flat dumbbell bench in A tier and decline dumbbell bench. I don't know if I said I put it in A tier. I'm putting it in S tier and I'm putting the flat dumbbell bench in A tier. The reason why I favor one a little bit more over the other is that you can kind of ego lift a little bit on decline presses, especially using a steep decline like that and lift a lot more weight then you really realistically would be able to on a flat press. Well, that is good to an extent because you're overloading your triceps. I would say just at that point, just do more direct tricep work, but it's still a good exercise. Like you are not, not be, you're, you're not gonna be wasting your time and not not be using a good exercise if you do the decline dumbbell bench press. It's just like the same situation as the dips. Chad exercise, it's just there are others that take higher priority if you have access to them. Dumbbell bench is just a better version of the decline dumbbell bench. It just it gives more immediate carryover, better resistance profile on the pecs. It's just overall better. Now we're down to a few more. Now this one is going to be the Giga Arch. And I, he's not really using that big of an arch, but let's just listen to what I'm saying and not what you're looking at. Because uh, he's wearing a singlet and those are calibrated plates that he's using. The Giga Arch Bench Press, in terms of increasing your one rep max bench press, is either gonna go in S tier or it's gonna go in D tier. If you have a relatively low arch and you suddenly want to start removing range of motion with a big arch, your ability to press with a lower arch is gonna diminish in comparison to the new skill that you're practicing. Now, again, if you put 200 pounds on your Giga Banana Back Arch Bench Press, yes, your flat back bench press is also going to go up, but not one to one. So if you bench 500 with a, a Giga Back, a Giga Arch Back, you're not going to flat press 500 pounds. It's more so going to be in the high 300s, low, low 400s, uh, if that. So it's either going to be S tier if you already bench mostly with a Giga Arch, or it's going to be D tier. Now, this is the seated barbell overhead press. I'm gonna put this, I'm gonna put this in B tier. I think that good overhead strength, at least, at the very least, maintaining your overhead mobility is going to allow you to remain pain free over your training career if you do a lot of bench pressing. Now, also shoulder strength plays a good role. I'm in the opinion that you can build raw shoulder strength with close grip bench and stuff like Lou raises. You don't need to do a, uh, like an overhead press to develop those qualities, but you can only develop good overhead mobility by doing overhead work. So that's like vertical pulls with a full range of motion and a dead hang, and then obviously overhead presses. 
I can't put them any higher than that because it doesn't have any direct carryover. It doesn't work your chest. And, you know, there's just other exercises that I would put at a higher priority, but still very good and very worthwhile in having in a strength training program. Marvin Eater used to say that shoulders were the seat of power for presses, and he, he benched 500 natty at like 190 pounds. So far be it for me to say that you couldn't get a huge bench press just by getting a huge seated overhead press in combination of your other chest presses. Now, dumbbell overhead press is going to go in the same tier for the same reasons. Arguably, maybe even a little bit better, just because you can rotate your hands around and it's just a more comfortable press for most people. The Swiss bar is going to go on S tier for the same reasons as the Arch Nemesis bar. And this is, I don't know why I have some dude doing trap bar shrugs here. Someone did ask about the trap bar bench press that Rick Del Stick, a.k.a. Sticky Rick, a.k.a. Rick and the Stick. I think he did it one time as a meme lift. Guys, it's, it's, it's a meme lift. Even he said it himself. He said it was super unstable. It, it, goes, it goes in a Del Hagen tier. Uh, there is no Del Hagen tier, so I'm just not going to rank it. Um... This is the lat prayer, a.k.a. straight arm pull down. I really like this one. I think I'm going to put it in A tier. It works the lats very well. It's a good core exercise. It also removes the biceps from your, uh, you know, your pulling because you're, you're just purely using your lats and you're stabilizing with your core. The reason why I don't put it in S tier is that low key with your pulls, you're more so doing them to develop a strong like rhomboids and upper back in addition to your lats, but also move your shoulders through a similar movement pattern kind of that you do on bench press. It, you just don't get that with a lat prayer, but you know, if you do them, you're not going to get not jacked. You know what I'm saying? So it goes in A tier. This one is the Smith Machine Bench Press. This one gets really disrespected. I'm not going to put it in S tier just because it doesn't have the most direct carryover. But I kind of put it in the same category as the dips and the weighted push-ups. Good hypertrophy exercise. Good movement that you can load heavily and push hard over time. Arguably low-key, even put it over dips because the stimulus to fatigue ratio is better on the Smith Press than with the dips. Um... I use it not for myself, but for some very strong bench pressers that I train. Uh, also, my boy Sam Sheether, who is in fact someone that I coach, who coaches very strong bench pressers as well, he uses this for some of his guys as well. So, good worthwhile exercise that you can consider. Cable rows, specifically ones done Arnold Schwarzenegger style with full retraction and protraction. Look guys, good scapular mechanics are something that is very uh, scantily trained with a lot of trainees. So it ends up being a pain point. You get pain in your shoulders because your scaps are just locked up and you don't know how to move them properly. You do that exercise, not only are you building your upper back and your, you know, everything that you do with a seal row and, and the standing barbell row, but you're training those fully protracted and retracted positions in your scapula, which is just excellent quality of life. So if you have access to a cable row, do it. And last but certainly not least is the incline dumbbell press. Um, great exercise that you can do. Works a larger range of motion, I would say, than the flat dumbbell press. But essentially, you get similar benefits that you would with the flat than you do with the incline. That's the list, guys. There's a lot of good things that you can do. There's not a lot of bad things that you can do to develop your bench press. Let me know how we did. So to what extent did we agree? Did I miss some exercises? Do you have any questions about this video? Leave those down below in the comments. I'm going to get to them. Any questions that you have for future videos? If you go back into my archives of videos and you say, for example, watch the self-coaching video, don't leave the question there because I'm not going to see it. Leave it on my most recent video and I'll be sure to get back to you. Y'all have a good one.